Hi everyone, I'm Katherine Frells. I'm a University of Minnesota plant breeder and my research is focused on breeding and improving winter annual oil seeds. Our objective is to develop pennycress and camelina varieties that are domesticated, high yielding, and also produce valuable oil, protein, and meal products. Our winter annual oilseed team is made up of many individual research labs, and I've compressed those many research labs into kind of four areas of pennycress improvement that you see here. But what I really want you to take away from this presentation is that the winter oilseed program, like all of the other Forever Green programs, is unique and successful because of the interaction between these different research areas. We get feedback um, both ways from all of these different research teams. And so we find new breeding targets or feed new materials into the end use or the agronomy program. Um, and that interaction really makes the breeding program strong. Earlier, Frank introduced you to the environmental benefits of using winter annual oil seeds in your cropping system. And luckily for us breeders and geneticists, there's also many useful genetic benefits to these two winter oil seed species. You can see on the right hand side that both of these species have genomic resources. We have sequenced genomes available to assist us with our breeding research. Camelina even has some breeding history. Most of that's been in spring annual camelina breeding, but we can utilize that foundation for the winter annual camelina development. Both of these crops are self-pollinated with short life cycles, and so that means any genetic changes that we make, we can be confident that they should be easily passed on to the next generation, and we can also make multiple generations of improvement each year. These species are also naturally high yielding with excellent oil and protein content and have pretty large seeds for wild species. So we're starting from a really good foundation um, for each of these crops. With those genetic benefits in mind, we have really selected two main breeding tools for these crops. The first tool is mutagenesis breeding, and that's where we chemically induce mutations to rapidly create genetic variation. And you can see on the picture on the left-hand side, a pennycrest plant with some dark green and really lime green sectors highlighted by some arrows. And that's a sign that the chemical mutagenesis worked. In the next generation, we can actually go out and then look for different traits uh, caused by those mutations, like in the next pictures, the normal flowered pennycress versus one with a lot more large flowers. Now, these chemically induced mutations might seem a little complicated, but it's actually a non-GMO breeding technique. All of these chemical mutations that were created are the same as the mutations that would be collected over time just by being exposed to UV rays from the sun. The difference is that they were all created very rapidly and in one population rather than us having to go out and search for these traits in individual populations. We also use wild genetic variation and so we have made pennycrest collections from all over the US, uh, North America, all the way up into Canada, as well as Europe and into Armenia. And because all of these collections were growing in different kinds of environments, they have different adaptations. And those different adaptations are things that we can select on to make improvements in our breeding program. And basically, we've been characterizing these wild collections to select for the best combinations of early flowering or seed yield or um, high oil contents. Our breeding targets for these two crops really fall into three categories, domestication, agronomic, and end-use quality. 
in these boxes, um, the reddish orange color indicates that these are traits that really weren't present in our wild collection and we're likely going to need to find them in our mutation breeding program. Yellow indicates that these are things that are present in our wild populations but need significant improvement and a lot of selection. Green are traits that are already present in our pool and really don't need a whole lot of selection and improvement, but they're things that we still consider and make sure we're maintaining in the breeding program. I'm going to cover some traits in all three of these uh, categories, and I'm going to start with the domestication traits. We're mostly focusing on pennycress with these traits, and that's because Camelina has already undergone breeding and selection, and so it's really already improved for these traits. In this picture of my pennycrest trial from about three years ago, you can see that there are definitely some emergence issues. There are um, plots that didn't come up at all or where only a few plants came up, and that's because wild-type pennycrest exhibits some seed dormancy and uneven emergence, especially when planted in dry conditions or in a poorly prepped seed bed. Compare this to Camelina, which doesn't really have these uh, problems, and we can see how far we need to go to improve pennycress. This next picture is an aerial photograph of one of our um, larger plot breeding trials. And here you can see that the progress we're making uh, in selecting for improved emergence. The red arrows indicate some of our wild type checks, and you can see in the uh, plot more to the foreground, some pretty poor emergence that's maybe about 50% emergence uh, compared to the wild type check in um, the back of the picture where we see maybe about 75% emergence. Uh, that um, variability is definitely a problem with the wild types and why we are excited about one of the top breeding lines we've elected indicated by the black arrows. Uh, this is a line that's germinating and emerging very um, quickly and uniformly, and in this trial was showing over 90% emergence um, very rapidly in the fall. Pod shatter is also a challenge in pennycress, and that's because it, as a wild species, pod shatter is really beneficial. The seeds break out of those pods, end up on the ground, and the plant is propagated to the next generation. However, as a crop species, we really don't want those seeds to end up on the ground because we lose that yield, and it also ends up with uh, volunteers the next year, as you can see in the photo on the right. These volunteers are easily controlled through herbicides or tillage. However, we really don't want farmers to have to take that extra step. We want all of their seeds to end up in the grain wagon at harvest. This is where our mutagenesis breeding program has really made great strides in developing a reduced shatter pennycrest line. You can see in the photos on the left, uh, photo A is what our wild type pennycrest looks like after a windstorm. There's about 25% of the pods left on that plant. In photo B, you can see one of our new reduced shatter lines after the same windstorm, and it still has about 100% of the pods on that plant. The figure on the right shows really what we're doing by um, increasing the pod strength of our new reduced shatter lines. The June 28th, even our wild type had all of the pods and this was probably because it would be just a little bit too um, high moisture content to combine and so those pods are still intact. Wait a week, those plants are dried down and easily shattered we've already lost 25% of the wild type yield, whereas our new reduced shatter lines have almost 100% of the seed pods um, still available for our harvest. Wait another week and you can see we're down to about 25% of the pods remaining on the plant for our wild type. 
whereas our reduced shatter lines still have most of their pods. By extending the harvest window, we make it easier for farmers to uh, harvest if there's a rain delay or other things going on and um, know that the yield is still going to be out there and not on the ground. However, despite having that longer harvest window, we'd never really recommend that farmers wait two weeks to harvest their pennycress. And that's because both pennycress and camelina are going to be targeted as a relay crop in Minnesota. What that means is that our summer annual, uh, whether it's soybeans or another uh, short season summer annual, is going to be planted directly into the pennycress or camelina stand. In this picture, you can see that there is a really great camelina stand, beautiful canopy, and then down in the skip rows, there are some small soybean plants. And you can tell because that camelina is so big and so dense that not a lot of sunlight is getting to those soybeans. And that's really what is causing most of the yield penalties on the soybeans. So what we want to do is reduce that time, that period of overlap between the two crops. And we can do that by selecting for early maturing pennycress and camelina lines. And these photos are out of our mutagenesis breeding program. Uh, you can see that what we're doing is we're looking for lines that both flower early and then mature or senesce early in both pennycress and camelina. And the great thing about this trait is that we can also select early flowering lines from our wild genetic variation program and then combine them with the early flowering uh, mutants found in this program. And hopefully that will make the lines mature even earlier. The final trait that I want to talk about today is focused on the end use quality of pennycress and camelina. These two figures show you the fatty acid profile, um, which is the oil profile of wild pennycress, canola, and our new pennycress line. In green, you can see the wild type pennycress is very high in urusic acid. Now this is a fatty acid that can really only be used for industrial purposes. It's not heart healthy and it's not good to consume uh, for humans or animals in large amounts. You can see that canola does not have any urusic acid and is instead high in oleic acid. Our new pennycrest line is very similar uh, to canola and it has no urusic acid, it's high in oleic, and what that means is that we can use this new pennycrest oil for the same types of uses that we could use canola oil. The benefit is it's grown over the fall, uh, winter, and into the early spring, and so it's more sustainable than your regular summer annual canola oil. We also want to improve the glucosinolate content of pennycress meal. And glucosinolates give it the give the meal a garlicky, um, kind of unpalatable flavor. And that can cause um, reduced rate of gains for animals that are fed pennycress meal, even though it has a really good protein content. We have found a low glucosinolate line indicated um, in the orange bars there, and we're now testing that line um, in our yield trials to make sure the trait is stable over multiple environments. I'd like to kind of summarize all of the traits and a couple other traits that we are working with in our breeding programs. And this table is just a list of some of our new pennycrest breeding lines and how they compare to our wild type checks indicated by the stars, by their names. You can see that what we're selecting for is lines that yield more than those checks or have higher oil content or a earlier flowering and maturity date or early uniform emergence. We really want to combine all of those traits in a single line, and that's the breeding process. 
Uh, we also need to make sure that we eventually get all of those mutation-based traits that I talked about into our top breeding lines. We have introgressed them into our wild type check, MIN 106, and we are um, now working on getting those traits into some of our breeding lines and eventually into our top breeding lines. This last figure that I want to show you is really to show how fast this project has moved. We started uh, working with Pennycress in 2012. That's when most of the wild collections were made, our first breeding crosses were made, and the genetic and mutagenesis um, research was initiated. We are now just eight years after that, and we've already found reduce shatter, we've improved yields and emergence, and we've made pennycress edible. Compare that to what it took to create canola from industrial rapeseed. That took multiple decades before uh, canola was safe for human consumption. And it's really due to all of the great new sequencing tools we have, new breeding technologies, and new plant science and plant biology research that has allowed us to move this fast. Now we expect to have a pennycress variety in about three to five years, and we expect camelina to come along on the same trajectory. I want to give you uh, some places to find more information. If this was really exciting science for you, uh, please check out our announcements and updates and our recent papers as they're posted on the Forever Green website or the I Prefer project, our new coordinated agricultural project for Pennycress. You can also check out our commercial collaborator, Covercress. If you wanna see some daily uh, updates or take a peek behind the lab coat and see what a plant breeder does every day or a plant uh, biology researcher does every day, you can follow uh, some of us on Twitter and uh, get some of those sneak peeks on what we're doing. Finally, I would be remiss if I didn't say that this project has moved so fast because we have a really great team of undergrads, um, grad students, staff scientists, postdocs, and um, PIs. So without this um, really fantastic team, we would be making a lot slower progress and um, we would be still with Pennycress as a weed and Camelina stuck as a spring annual. So with that, I will wrap things up and I can take your questions later.